Hi, Camilla. Hi, Monica. Hi, Oscar. Cool. Okay, well, while everyone is, um, is joining the Zoom, um, I'll just get going with a little introduction. Um, so thank you all for coming. Um, this one of the last Sensi Lab forums of the year. Um, so I'd like to start by acknowledging and paying my respects to the people of the Kulin Nations, the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm hosting this event today, and to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And um, just a little bit of background for those of you who are joining us for the first time. Sensi Lab is an art and technology research laboratory based at Monash University in Australia. And we host these forums regularly as a showcase for uh, creators and researchers who are exploring the undiscovered creative opportunities of technology. So um, we are recording this Zoom. Um, it will be available um, on the Sensi Lab website after the session today. And um, today we're going to be hearing from Lucy Kettleson, who is a designer and a sustainability researcher. And she is a forthcoming um, Sensi Lab PhD student, so we're going to be excited to welcome her next year. Uh, Lucy's practice considers notions of risk and control in digital, automated, and industrial textile production, and through subverting traditional processes, practices with unlikely processes and materials. And um, today, Lucy's going to reflect on um, some of the ways she's dismantled and reassembled her practice to be more responsible and better able to imagine space for the not yet. So thank you, Lucy. I'm really excited to hear more about your practice and um, and your uh, and your um, reflections on what you've what you've done, your journey so far, and um, and where you're going. So welcome to the forum. Um, welcome everyone else as well. And please, as usual, just write your questions in the chat window. Lucy will be able to um, have a little Q&A at the end and um, we'll all get a chance to, to know her and her work better. So I'm going to disappear and uh, hand over to you, Lucy. Thank you so much. Thanks, Katie. Okay, so um, yeah, as, as Katie mentioned, um, I'm a designer and a practice-based researcher. Um, so I've mostly been looking into ways to um, embed risk um, back into processes and materials where it's been removed. Um, so just a bit about me, I'm coming from a background of textile-based um, sampling and prototyping, so thinking through materials. Um, I choose to situate my practice in the field of textiles due to its unassuming character, so it's um, often mistaken for being more, I guess, shallow, um, superfluous or frivolous than it actually is. Um, and it's a really rich field and one that's both highly technical and also deeply rooted in tradition. So this means that my practice is very materials driven, process centric, and also revolves around um, soft things, um, messy things, and of course the body. So over the past few years, I've um, focused on engaging with unlikely materials, which has been things like textile scraps, damaged textiles, offcuts, um, waste blended textiles, which are particularly problematic because you have to, um, to deal with when you have to destroy the other um, and materials with no uh, kind of value assigned or, and most recently with bacteria. Um, so my practice is complicit not only with mess um, and the uncertainty of um, these kind of unusual materials, but also mediation. Um, so engaging with uh, digital design and fabrication processes, um, which I basically see like a translation. So, um, you know, in, in the same way that when you're translating from one language to the other, you not only have to um, understand the meanings that you want to bring across, but um, you also have to um, commit to uh, reconstituting or completely rewriting those meanings again in, in, a, new, um, in a new language. Um, so I found this way of thinking and working to be really valuable um, because in a translation, there's a tangible tension present. Um, so this is a positive dynamic that um, I see as like really valuable for kind of maintaining what Pi referred to as a workmanship of risk in conditions that were not yet conditions, things that we haven't quite seen yet. So I'm coming to this um, sort of mediated practice of engaging constructively with excess by a sustainable fashion and textiles. So I've walked away from commercially leaning guarantees. So this is actually back in 2014, um, but I'm bringing two things forward. So the first is um, a practice of translating felt conditions 
in concrete ways, so um, discretizing animal states and um, I really used uh, draping cloth to sort of translate traces from three dimensions uh, into two dimensions and I found this a really useful tool and also a metaphor that I carry into other contexts. Um, and then um, also a materials focus and um, a contingency. Um, so I committed to communicating through the new language of, of things and I find materials are very evocative and they carry and convey things that we're not able to say. So walking away from this kind of commercial learning guarantees, um, I went into um, a practice-based research at RMIT in Melbourne, so they allowed, allowed me to set up my practice in Vietnam. Um, so um, I set up the project so that I could engage with um, textile waste and also the local um, SMEs, small to medium enterprises. So there's a lot of you know, um, digital embroidery, machine embroidery, hand embroidery, digital printing, um, garment construction, laser cutting, laser etching, you name it, um, kind of scattered all over the city. Um, so it was really important for me to address chaos, but also to embrace mess. So um, these are my photos uh, taken on the outskirts of um, Ho Chi Minh City. Um, so I found it kind of like these chaotic systems, um, mostly about kind of letting a market and machine logic determine socio-cultural conditions and the means of production. So kind of all the stuff that William Morris got so upset about at the outset of the Industrial Revolution. Um, so in this kind of chaos, you find well, linear, inflexible processes reductive approaches to materials and a high degree of risk aversion. And the consequences, of course, um, waste, um, which is, I would say, like threatening because it's meaningless excess. Um, so it's not necessarily, well, I find that it's not necessarily any particular fiber type or production means that's inherently damaging in and of itself, but more the system and at its core and to its full extent is predicated on the ability to discharge waste. And it's the vast meaninglessness of, of this that's threatening and difficult to relate to. Um, so embracing mess, um, I kind of place my practice in proximity to like real disorder and this um, stance necessitated creating something out of nothing. There was no local precedent in terms of um, making, there was no pre-existing context uh, value structure or support. Um, so I had to commit to crafting alternative um, contexts and values. Um, I committed to working with no virgin fibers, only waste, local tech, uh, local equipment, and to reference the local context. So there are a lot of like really messy processes, as you can see. Um, so as, for example, laser cutting tape and embroidery from old shirts, um, layering and heat bonding packaging, um, to make sequins, making recycled polyester digital lace from tablet drawn uh, flowers, um, or using like enzymes to etch or knock the cellulose fibers out of um, blended textiles. And many of these experiments were not immediately successful or even particularly aesthetic. Um, so I, I found that I'm working with fragments um, I could explore juxtaposition of contrasting materials and kind of holding materials together, finding ways to suggest a sense of coming apart and I explored experimental acts of mending, patchwork, um, lacing, lace embroidery that suggested tenuous unions and um, unstable cohesion. And then working with rhythms, I explored acts of collapsing or reconfiguring through flattening, ritual layering, um, the layering of procedural complexity and also the insertion of pores. So this, um, this sampling phase and led on to two more kind of pointed um, prototyping phases, the first of which was um, Saigon Shirt, which was a collaboration with Melbourne Label Chorus. Um, it kept similar parameters to the previous phase, um, which was a commitment to working only with waste. Um, so I um, used uh, secondhand mixed composition men's shirts um, and recycled polyester, um, which I found at uh, local markets. Um, 
And again, I drew inspiration from the local context. So in this case, the city's um, unique modernist buildings. I spent a lot of time going around on my motorbike, capturing facades and tracing these details into perspective. So I had like a bank of images to work with. Um, so then working in the digital enabled um, kind of quite a lot of aspects of this project to unfold. So it was um, this capacity for endless editing enabled a level of complexity of detail that wouldn't otherwise have been possible. Also enabled me to um, be flexible in um, fixing the dimensions uh, to fit the waste and also as a means to communicate with um, industrial machines. So by collapsing and synthesizing dozens of perspectival views across left and right bodice panels um, and digi digitizing these files, um, it was actually a very like time consuming process. And I think one that's kind of misunderstood. So digital embroidery is often seen as something that's quick, easy and automated, but actually each segment had to be digitized um, individually. Uh, you have to be very mindful of the order. And um, I guess, for hand embroidery, risk is something that's felt and it's very immediately tangible. Whereas um, in uh, for for digital embroidery, it's um, risk is kind of being fractured or, or scattered and has to then be like reinserted. So each panel had about eleven thousand stitches and it took about three no, sorry four hours to stitch out. Um, and took, so this whole process for the entire production run took several days um, and then another few days for the cut work um, that myself and a, um, a small uh, group of hand embroiderers did. Um, and then the, the panels were sent back to Melbourne and um, uh, they were made into these um, actually beautifully draped and constructed shirts. Um, so it was really limited production run, um, so it sold out. Um, but mostly was this success um, because this kind of limited run bespoke industrial approach um, was kind of uh, one of the more promising developments to emerge from my research, um, which then led into the final phase um, of prototyping for my master's research. Um, this is uh, already in Vietnamese, but it's a three shirt. Um, so it's a bespoke industrial piece. Um, it allowed me to explore a practice of creatively contriving risk um, and embedding it into like process and material. Um, so it's made again entirely um, of fabric scraps and recycled materials. So the front panels and lacing tapes are all silk, the back panel is polyester, and these um, materials are all found in the same box of um, scraps. The placement embroidery is also uh, recycled polyester sewing thread, also sourced locally. Um, so this piece kind of speaks to a localized iteration of sustainability, which um, displays its complicity with so-called like unsustainable materials and making processes. Um, and it responds to a certain as is quality. So I tried to keep um, things as I found them. Um, so this is not only the materials, but also the local conditions and nebulous qualities, like a sense of coming apart or an uncomfortable proximity, um, incongruous interlacing, um, an awareness of violence and fragility. So uh, kind of central preoccupation um, through this research phase was um, that of crafted control. So that essentially involved considering the way that tension is encountered in handmaking and the way that it must be reintroduced in the digital and industrial. Um, I introduced risk through procedural complexity by interlinking numerous processes, laser cutting, digital embroidery, sublimation printing, hand embroidery and cut work, lacing, pressing, washing, etc all laid into a single workflow that had to be managed through negotiation of fast and slow rhythms. So basically I designed for complexities that couldn't simply be automated um, by picking up systemless fragments and intentionally placing them amidst risk averse um, making scenarios such as what you'd find in a factory, um, which necessitated the devotion of careful attention. So this piece was um, shown um, in the Slow Fashion Lab at RMIT Gallery um, and was part of um, the Fast Fashion Exhibition, which is organized um, by RMIT and the Goethe Institute. Um, so as I was wrapping up my thesis, um, I 
um, started Textile Academy and this um, yellow jacket is the final um, project from, um, from that study. Um, it was inspired by a lichen strain called Rosella Montani, which I was researching. So it goes back to kind of from Tyrian purple. It's been used since like 2000 BC. It's a really fascinating lichen and a, a particular kind of textile dye. Um, so I kind of look to lichen as something like an agent of change. Um, I found the, the lichen by following a lead from a footnote um, to a remote coastal site in southern Vietnam. I found it on shrub branches on an unregistered local dump site. Um, and I really became interested in this uh, lichen um, as a model species for what's referred to in the sustainability literature as um, adaptive resilience. So they grow without depleting the substrate that they grow in, so they can almost survive on, on, on air. Um, they're very sensitive and responsive, um, but they're also um, uh, hybrids. So it's the hybridity that makes them so adaptable and unique. Um, so I followed a lichen-esque model um, to envisage a garment as an assembly in three ways. So firstly, through um, zero waste draping. So um, this is both draping cloth and a mannequin at a hard scale, but then also um, in like, 3D software. Um, as you can see, there are numerous ways that this can be done and you don't actually change the substrate itself, but merely um, transfer information so um, as you can see, the panel on the left-hand side contains like all of the information, but the original like, um, you know, piece of uncut um, end of roll um, textile waste is, remains the same. <clears throat> so then I took these shapes um, into like um, a responsive space so I could um, create surface embellishment using diffusion limited aggregation. Um, so this piece is obviously parametric, so depending on the dimensions of the waste that you would bring in, that the, the surface uh, design would respond accordingly. And then um, finally, in order to make the garment um, sensitive and responsive, I um, uh, made it a simple sensor by reducing graphene oxide onto um, uh, poly cotton um, textile. Um, and then using this as a nitrogen dioxide sensor. Um, so basically, um, reduced graphene oxide will uniquely respond to in the presence of nitrogen dioxide um, to a much greater degree than any other gases. So um, the resistance will drop and then that triggered the lighting of an LED. Um, so for the um, for fabrication, basically I collapsed um, sort of numerous codes into one space. Um, so that's pattern design, uh, construction and embellishment, which enables everything to, to be um, effectively stitched out in one fell swoop. Um, I um, made the LED from by um, 3D printing some kind of recursive gems and I combined the lichen acids, which were a byproduct of the textile dyeing process with a, like a bioresin. Um, and this is uh, just showing how I um, how I made the, the sensor. So actually the process of reducing graphene oxide onto this blended textile, I think I failed about three times. It was, um, it was quite challenging, but um, uh, managed to, to take it out into um, the polluted air of Hoshima City and get, um, get a reading. So it was quite exciting. Um, and finally with um, the lichen dyeing. So this, takes several months. Um, it was yeah, really fascinating, but a very, very slow process. Um, and the, the color can um, be adjusted just simply by adjusting the, the pH of the dye bath. Um, this is a really ancient, ancient process. So um, this piece was a finalist in Reshape um, and was showing digital fashion night as part of Alta Roma. And um, I also wrote a short paper on packing um, the making process and submitted it to Afria Journal and it will be published uh, next month. Uh, so it takes me to um, my current project, which is Gen Gem. Um, so I'm doing this project at Symbiotica. So for those of you that are not aware, it's um, uh, a biological arts lab uh, at the University of Western Australia. 
um, set up by um, Yanadza and Oren Katz. Um, so they have a very strong uh, history as pioneers in the field of bio art, um, going back several decades. Um, so I've been really fortunate to have the opportunity to work with bacterial iridescence to grow structural color and the substrates over which it grows. So I discovered bacterial iridescence as I was um, kind of revisiting the enzymes that I was using to try to knock the cellulose fibers out of blended fabrics. So I found that a few strains of bacteria have actually evolved and adapted to anthropogenic effects of their environments um, so that they produce enzymes that can break down nylon-6. Um, and as it turns out, um, some of these strains are actually iridescent. So um, as soon as I found this out, I immediately contacted Symbiotica and they invited me in and um, the rest was not quite so fast. So I actually just got their cultures last month. Um, and so I've been exploring iridescence as a kind of refractive phenomenon, um, allowing it to infect processes and techniques that are not generally touched by biological life. Um, so I've been reflecting on the process. Um, here's um, my piece on our research catalog. This is um, the, the bacteria, let me the sound. You can see it's iridescence is uh, growing on blood agar. Um, this is a, uh, another blood agar with a different nutrient concentration. Um, so you can see that the color can be tuned based on the, the substrate. Um, as I was waiting for the cultures, I did some kind of preliminary modeling, just kind of playing around with um, shapes that would approximate the kind of substrates that these bacteria found on, but also just more generally like um, biofilms. Um, on what you know, their behavior and the growth. Okay. Um, so as I said last month when I got the, the cultures, I started um, uh, to grow um, mostly Flavobacterium johnsonii over different media to, to see the, um, the effect on, on iridescence. I basically found that it's only growing on blood agar, which has been slightly problematic because um, firstly, I ran, I ran out of uh, plates and I had to go get some more blood, which is um, easier said than done. Um, so, and I've um, been experimenting, I'm not sure if you can see on the right, um, different nutrient media, and I'm going to continue this for the rest of the month. Um, and so, in addition to um, changing the, the, the nutrient media, I've also been experimenting with the, the substrates. So, um, in addition to the, the review of literature and looking at the kind of morphology of biofilms and um, substrates, I've just been beach climbing and uh, finding objects. Um, you know, they, these a lot of these bacteria are um, occurring in um, soil, but also on um, like rocky shores and beaches. So um, I've been you know, looking at these um, substrates up close and then trying to, to model them um, and 3D printing them on a um, um, SLA resin printer and then um, sterilizing and some kind of soaking in um, double distilled water um, and then infecting these substrates. Um, so it's actually, despite the fact that these bacteria um, you know, can eat nylon, they don't seem to like plastic substrates so much. Um, so I've had to kind of coat them in um, uh, blood agar and try to keep them moist because um, the um, what makes these bacteria iridescent is their flighty motility, their ability to, to move um, and colonize surfaces. Um, so once the colonies become iridescent, um, I will then need to like bring them down to like four degrees or um, I'll be doing some imaging um, in January. So um, I should be able to do cryo SEM. You have to bring the sample, the infected substrate uh, down to minus 180, so then they're able to image um, live samples. Um, but also, I'll then need to 
find a way to, to kind of kill and fix the colonies so that the iridescence maintain, uh, is maintained intact because it's because it's structural color. So if you disrupt the, the colony or the iridescent subcolony, then you lose the color. So I've been trying to, um, as you can see the experiments on the left, trying to um, move these colonies from Petri dish to um, cover slip using um, like polyolysine coated cover slips and, um, and putting PBS and glyceraldehyde at the edges. So, so far I haven't been able to preserve it intact. Um, so this is something I'm going to need to work on further. Um, so there's still quite a lot um, left to do for this process as you can see but mostly what um, I'm working towards is um, sort of not seeing the substrates and these objects as um, kind of yeah finished objects in and of themselves but seeing them as um, something to be imaged and then those images are used as like a further step through which to create um, other um, models in response. Okay, which um, brings me to the projects um, that I'm proposing for next year, um, which I've called Draw Breath. So um, I really uh, was interested in looking into, um, into this project um, or to setting this up to address a scenario um, in which the, the future is, is sort of cancelled or the space in the present is um, choked or asphyxiated. Um, this kind of linear historical march of time that ends in an inevitable crash um, and scenarios in which we have humanity without bodies or bodies without humanity. Um, and I think given that we're facing increasingly sophisticated objectification and surveillance via devices and wearables, um, I felt, felt the need to um, kind of imagine more space or hypothesize ways of crafting that space for alternatives. Um, so at this early stage, um, I would propose the research question is just asking how to craft an alternative ecology for the breath or, you know, kind of how can tangible material objects be used to um, ground our understanding of shifting phenomena, but really to see the shifting phenomena and then address how complicated it is to make um, kind of claims to fixed and stable knowledge. Um, so again, this is really early, so I'm just proposing a work, uh, workflow for um, early phase, but um, um, I, I would really be interested in crafting features uh, from, um, from the breath. Um, so in a way, I would like to use um, unsupervised learning um, in order to, to help with um, crafting these features. So um, for example, just um, setting thresholds on um, X and Y axis. So this is, I guess, taking inspiration from the arousal um, valence model to interpret patterns from um, breathing data. Um, and then mostly just working with um, a wearable sensor the, um, 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 and bringing into like Wekinator or open signals. Um, that, uh, or working with existing data sets, as I said, to, um, to use uh, unsupervised learning for, um, to be able to kind of see the, the probability um, of um, certain data features um, so that I'm better able to, to craft those features and then um, explore the relationship between a feature and response or input and output. Um, so um, yeah, I'm looking forward to exploring that further next year. Um, that's about it for now. I hope nobody's dozed off. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy. That's fantastic. Um, so now we have a bit of time for Q&A and because I know most of the people on the attendee list, I'm actually, I think it might be nice if we all were able to say hi to Lucy and she could see our faces. So I'm gonna bring you all in as panelists, um, if you don't want to be brought in as a panelist, you still will have control over your microphone, your camera, so you don't have to switch it on, but um, I'm just going to give you the option. So and while I'm doing that, maybe Lucy, I could, um, I could start off the Q&A with a question about, um, about the impact of this work and the, the, the communities that you're speaking to with it, because I mean, you talked a little bit about label collaborations and I, it made me wonder whether you see the kind of, the, there being kind of industrial 
impacts or you see some of these techniques as being used in the textile industry or are you is it more speculative space what, what's your kind of take on um on that yeah to be honest i haven't really thought about any kind of collaboration or um scaling this at all um i think at this stage i'm most interested in um just crafting features and sort of being very, I guess, like insular to begin with, um, just so that I really do understand um, um, the kinds of patterns that would be emerging through the breath. Um, yeah, I guess it's a, a little bit too early for me to, to kind of think about, um, you know, um, how, how that um, kind of practice would be relevant outside. But yeah, I would definitely be interested in the future. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, I'm just finally getting everyone into the room and allowing them all to be panelists. So now you can see everyone's faces <laughs> and everyone can meet you. Um, do you, does anyone have any, um, any questions for Lucy? Or maybe we could also do a little bit of an introduction for some of the people in the, um, on this Zoom so she knows a bit about um, who everyone is and, and, um, what we all kind of work on. So should we, I'll start off with any, any questions particularly about the, about the talk? Um, I've got a question just to kick things off. Hi, Lucy. Thank you for the presentation. It's great. Um, just really interested in the concept of place in your work. It seemed, because you, you seem to have this very interesting trajectory of work that you've done, and it, it's all kind of centered around geographically where you've, where you've been. Mm -hmm. um, the, obviously, the work in Vietnam was very much inspired by the environment there, um, both mm -hmm. the human environment and the natural environment. Mm -hmm. And then in Perth, working at Symbiotica, you know, there's a very obvious, um, it's kind of shifted to, to a more kind of scientific or exploratory mode of inquiry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just curious as to how you consider place in your work or how you, do you consider it or is it just a sort of a natural um, kind of, um, corollary of, of, of being somewhere that you kind of absorb that environment and reflect on it? Yeah, I guess um, for my research so far, I've just felt like the need to be honest um, and to be frank about my influences and uh, my making conditions. And so even with um, Symbiotica, the fact that you're in a lab, so you have access to certain things that usually you wouldn't be able to, or just even the ability to work with bacteria, like, um, I have to speak to those conditions because they're shaping the practice or, and then I think in, in Vietnam, I think one of the reasons that I was engaging with that kind of waste is because it's so apparent and ubiquitous, whereas it's like, I, I come back to Australia and I don't see any waste anywhere. It's, it's like, it's very different um, sort of scenarios. I think I was mostly just wanting to like, honestly engage with um, the, the conditions that I found myself in and um, yeah, reflect on them and allow them to be visible, to be transparent about what was um, influencing the practice. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, that's great, thanks. Other questions? Maybe, um, other people's work now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, maybe I think that might be really nice. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, maybe I'll get um, everyone to just do like a really little tiny intro on, on, on who you are and, and a bit about your work so Lucy knows who we are. Um, I'll just call you up in the order of my screen. Um, Alon, you're, you're first up. Monica, do you want to add something? Uh, actually, I, I did have a question. I just was Sorry, just... Monica, I didn't mean to see you. <laughs> yeah, Go ahead. I just want to say really interesting talk. Really, really great to see that. Um, I was wondering, because you mentioned repeatedly that something didn't work out the first time or the second time and you had to try again and again. So uh, yeah. do you have a recipe for dealing with failure? How do you <laughs> go on? <laughs> Just based my entire practice around it. <laughs> I think it was intentional. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, I guess, so, well, I wouldn't be working with the iridescent bacteria that I'm working with now if I hadn't encountered the other failure of trying to, you know, knock out the cellulose fibers. And so I guess, um, I don't know, just leave traces and then just leave the possibility that you can return to your failures. Like, I don't know, I think it's, it, you know, it's like a fertile ground, you know, as long as 
you keep her trace and I think, yeah, reflecting on, um, you know, practice that unfolds um, not in necessarily a linear way. And as long as you've reflected, I think like um, documenting is helpful because, you know, it's, it's still there. You can go back to it. You don't know that it's going to be useful later, but, you know, yeah. Thank you.